Hello, and welcome to Wiki on Tape. Today, I will be reading about David Berkowitz. This recording was made on Tuesday, September 8, 2020 by Wiki on Tape V1.1.0. Let's get started. Summary David Richard Berkowitz, born Richard David Falco, June 1, 1953, also known as the son of Sam and the .44 caliber killer, is an American serial killer who pleaded guilty to eight separate shooting attacks that began in New York City during the summer of 1976. Berkowitz grew up in New York City and served in the U.S. Army before committing his crimes. Using a .44 caliber bulldog revolver, he killed six people and wounded seven others by July 1977. The killing spree terrorized New Yorkers and gained worldwide notoriety. As the number of victims increased, Berkowitz eluded the biggest police manhunt in the history of New York City while leaving letters that mocked the police and promised further crimes, which were highly publicized by the press. On the night of August 10, 1977, Berkowitz was taken into custody by NYPD homicide detectives in front of his Yonkers apartment building. He was subsequently indicted for eight shooting incidents. He confessed to all of them, and initially claimed to have been obeying the orders of a demon manifested in the form of a dog belonging to his neighbor, Sam. Despite his explanation, Berkowitz was found mentally competent to stand trial. He pled guilty to second-degree murder and was incarcerated in state prison. He subsequently admitted that the dog and devil story was a hoax. In the course of further police investigations, Berkowitz was also implicated in many unsolved arsons in the city. Intense coverage of the case by the media lent a kind of celebrity status to Berkowitz, which he seemed to enjoy, as noted by some observers. In response, the New York State Legislature enacted new statutes, known popularly as, Son of Sam Laws, designed to keep criminals from financially profiting from the publicity created by their crimes. The statutes have remained law in New York despite various legal challenges, and similar laws have been enacted in several other states. Berkowitz has been incarcerated since his arrest and is serving six consecutive life sentences. During the mid-1990s, he amended his confession to claim that he had been a member of a violent satanic cult that orchestrated the incidents as ritual murder. A few law enforcement authorities have said that his claims might be credible, but he remains the only person ever charged with the shootings. A new investigation of the murders began in 1996, but was suspended indefinitely after inconclusive findings. Early life David Berkowitz was born Richard David Falco on June 1, 1953, in Brooklyn, New York. His mother, Elizabeth, Betty, Broder, grew up as part of an impoverished Jewish family, and was a waitress. She married Tony Falco, an Italian-American, in 1936. After a marriage of less than four years, Tony Falco left her for another woman. In 1950, Broder started a relationship with a married man named Joseph Kleinman. Three years later, she became pregnant with a child to whom she chose to give the surname Falco and, within a few days of Richard's birth, Broder gave the child away. Although her reasons for doing so are unknown, writers have surmised that Kleinman threatened to abandon her if she kept the baby and used his name. The infant boy was adopted by Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz of the Bronx. The Jewish-American couple were hardware store retailers of modest means, and childless in middle age. They reversed the order of the boy's first and middle names and gave him their own surname, raising young David Richard Berkowitz as their only child. Journalist John Vincent Sanders wrote that Berkowitz's childhood was, somewhat troubled. Although of above-average intelligence, he lost interest in learning at an early age and became infatuated with petty larceny and starting fires. Neighbors and relatives would recall Berkowitz as difficult, spoiled, and a bully. His adoptive parents consulted at least one psychotherapist due to his misconduct, but his misbehavior never resulted in a legal intervention or serious mention in his school records. He attended public school number 123 and public school number 77. Berkowitz's adoptive mother died of breast cancer when he was 14 years old, and his home life became strained during later years, particularly because he disliked his adoptive father's second wife. 
He lived with his father while attending Christopher Columbus High School, graduating in 1971, and college in a four-and-a-half-room apartment at 170 Dracer Loop in Co-op City in the Bronx from 1967 to 1971. In 1971, at the age of 17, Berkowitz joined the United States Army and served in Fort Knox in the United States and with an infantry division in South Korea. After an honorable discharge in June 1974, he located his birth mother, Betty. After a few visits, she disclosed the details of his birth. The news greatly disturbed Berkowitz, and he was particularly distraught by the array of reluctant father figures. Forensic anthropologist Elliot Layton described Berkowitz's discovery of his adoption and birth details as the primary crisis of his life, a revelation that shattered his sense of identity. His communication with his birth mother later lapsed, but for a time he remained in communication with his half-sister, Roslyn. He attended Bronx Community College for one year, enrolling in the spring of 1975. In 1976 he went to work as a driver for the Co-op City Taxi Company. He subsequently had several non-professional jobs, and at the time of his arrest was working as a letter sorter for the United States Postal Service. Crimes begin, late 1975, early 1977. During the mid-1970s, Berkowitz started to commit violent crimes. He bungled the first attempt at murder using a knife, then switched to a handgun and began a lengthy crime spree throughout the New York boroughs of the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. He sought young female victims. He was purportedly most attracted to women with long dark wavy hair. All but one of the crime sites involved two victims, he infamously committed some of his attacks while the women sat with boyfriends in parked cars. He exhibited an enduring enjoyment of his activities, often returning to the scenes of his crimes. Foreman Stabbing December 1975 Berkowitz claimed that when he was 22 years old he committed his first attack on Christmas Eve, 1975, when he used a hunting knife to stab two women in Co-op City. One alleged victim, a Hispanic woman, was never identified by police, but the other was 15-year-old Michelle Foreman, a sophomore at Truman High School, whom he attacked on a bridge near Dracer Loop and whose injuries were serious enough for her to be hospitalized for seven days. Berkowitz was not suspected of these crimes, and soon afterward he relocated to an apartment in Yonkers, New York just north of the New York City border, 20 to 25 minutes from Co-op City. Loria and Valenti shooting, July 1976 The first shooting attributed to the son of Sam occurred in the Pelham Bay area of the Bronx. At about 1.10 a.m. on July 29, 1976, Donna Loria, an emergency medical technician, 18, and her friend Jody Valenti, a nurse, 19, were sitting in Valenti's double-parked Oldsmobile, discussing their evening at Peachtree's, a new Rochelle discotheque. Loria opened the car door to leave and noticed a man quickly approaching the car. Startled and angered by the man's sudden appearance, she said, Now what is this? The man produced a pistol from the paper bag that he carried and crouched. He braced one elbow on his knee, aimed his weapon with both hands, and fired. Loria was struck by one bullet that killed her instantly. Valenti was shot in her thigh, and a third bullet missed both women. The shooter turned and walked away quickly. Valenti survived her injury and said that she did not recognize the killer. She described him as a white male in his 30s with a fair complexion, about 5 feet 9 inches, 1.75 meters, tall and weighing about 160 pounds, 73 kilograms. His hair was short, dark, and curly in a, mod style. This description was repeated by Loria's father, who claimed to have seen a similar man sitting in a yellow compact car parked nearby. Neighbors gave corroborating reports to police that an unfamiliar yellow compact car had been cruising the area for hours before the shooting. Denaro and Keenan shooting, October on October 23, 1976, a similar shooting occurred in a secluded residential area of Flushing, Queens, next to Bone Park. Carl DeNaro, a Citibank security guard, 20, and Rosemary Keenan, a Queens College student, 18, were sitting in Keenan's parked car when the window suddenly shattered. 
I felt the car exploded, sick. Denaro said later. Keenan quickly started the car and sped away for help. The panicked couple did not realize that someone had been shooting at them, even though Denaro was bleeding from a bullet wound to his head. Keenan had only superficial injuries from the broken glass, but Denaro eventually needed a metal plate to replace a portion of his skull. Neither victim saw the attacker. Police determined that the bullets embedded in Keenan's car were .44 caliber, but they were so deformed that they thought it unlikely that they could ever be linked to a particular weapon. Denaro had shoulder-length hair, and police later speculated that the shooter had mistaken him for a woman. Keenan's father was a 20-year veteran police detective of the New York City Police Department, NYPD, causing an intense investigation. As with the Loria Valenti shooting, however, there seemed not to be any motive for the shooting, and police made little progress with the case. Many details of the Denaro Keenan shooting were very similar to the Loria Valenti case, but police did not initially associate them, partly because the shootings occurred in different boroughs and were investigated by different local police precincts. Damasi and Lamino shooting, November. High school student Donna Damasi, 16, and Joanne Lamino, a student at Martin Van Buren High School, 18, walked home from a movie soon after midnight on November 27, 1976. They were chatting on the porch of Lamino's home in Floral Park, when a man dressed in military fatigues who seemed to be in his early 20s approached them and began to ask directions. In a high-pitched voice he said, can you tell me how to get, but then quickly produced a revolver. He shot each of the victims once and, as they fell to the ground injured, he fired several more times, striking the apartment building before running away. A neighbor heard the gunshots, rushed out of the apartment building, and saw a blonde man rush by gripping a pistol in his left hand. Damasi had been shot in the neck, but the wound was not life-threatening. Lamino was hit in the back and hospitalized in serious condition. She was ultimately rendered paraplegic. Freund and Deal shooting, January 1977. At about 12:40 a.m. on January 30, 1977, Christine Freund, a secretary, 26, and her fiancé John Deal, a bartender, 30, were sitting in Deal's car near the Forest Hills LIRR station in Queens, preparing to drive to a dance hall after having seen the movie Rocky. Three gunshots penetrated the car. In a panic, Deal drove away for help. He suffered minor superficial injuries, but Freund was shot twice and died several hours later at the hospital. Neither victim had seen their attacker. Police made the first public acknowledgement that the Freund deal shooting was similar to earlier incidents, and that the crimes might be associated. All the victims had been struck with .44 caliber bullets, and the shooting seemed to target young women with long dark hair. NYPD Sergeant Richard Conlon stated that police were leaning towards a connection in all these cases. Composite sketches were released of the black-haired Loria Valenti shooter and the blonde Lamino Damasi shooter, and Conlon noted that police were looking for multiple suspects, not just one. Voskarikian shooting, March 8. At about 7.30 p.m. on March 8, 1977, Columbia University student Virginia Voskarikian, 19, was walking home from school when she was confronted by an armed man. She lived about a block from where Christine Freund had been shot. In a desperate move to defend herself, Voskarikian lifted her textbooks between herself and her killer, but the makeshift shield was penetrated, the bullet striking her head and killing her. Press and Publicity March 10. In a March 10, 1977, press conference, NYPD officials and New York City Mayor Abraham Beam declared that the same .44 Bulldog revolver had fired the shots that killed Loria and Voskarikian. Official documents were later revealed, however, saying that police strongly suspected that the same .44 Bulldog had been used in the shootings, but that the evidence was actually inconclusive. The crimes were discussed by the local media virtually every day. Circulation increased dramatically for the New York Post and Daily News, newspapers with graphic crime reporting and commentary. Foreign media featured many of the reports as well, including front-page articles of newspapers such as the Vatican's L'Osservator Romano, the Hebrew newspaper Marav, and the Soviet Izvestia. 
Esau and Suriani shooting, April. At about 3 a.m. on April 17, 1977, Alexander Esau, a tow truck operator, 20, and Valentina Suriani, an aspiring actress and model, 18, were sitting in Suriani's car near her home in the Bronx, only a few blocks from the scene of the Loria Valenti shooting, when each was shot twice. Suriani died at the scene, and Esau died in the hospital several hours later without being able to describe his attackers. Police said that the weapon used for the crime was the same as the one which they had suspected in the earlier shootings. Son of Sam Letter Police discovered a handwritten letter near the bodies of Esau and Suriani, written mostly in block capitals with a few lower case letters, and addressed to NYPD Captain Joseph Borelli. With this letter, Berkowitz revealed the name, Son of Sam, for the first time. The press had previously dubbed the killer, the .44 caliber killer, because of his weapon of choice. The letter was initially withheld from the public, but some of its contents were revealed to the press, and the name, Son of Sam, quickly replaced the old name. The letter expressed the killer's determination to continue his work, and taunted police for their fruitless efforts to capture him. In full, with misspellings intact, the letter read, I am deeply hurt by your calling me a woman hater. I am not. But I am a monster. I am the, son of Sam. I am a little, brat. When Father Sam gets drunk he gets mean. He beats his family. Sometimes he ties me up to the back of the house. Other times he locks me in the garage. Sam loves to drink blood. Go out and kill, commands Father Sam. Behind our house some rest. Mostly young, raped and slaughtered, their blood drained, just bones now. Papa Sam keeps me locked in the attic, too. I can't get out but I look out the attic window and watch the world go by. I feel like an outsider. I am on a different wavelength than everybody else, programmed to kill. However, to stop me you must kill me. Attention all police. Shoot me first, shoot to kill or else. Keep out of my way or you will die. Papa Sam is old now. He needs some blood to preserve his youth. He has had too many heart attacks. Too many heart attacks. Uh, me who did you RTS sunny boy. I miss my pretty princess most of all. She's resting in our lady's house but I'll see her soon. I am the, monster, Beelzebub, the, chubby behemoth. I love to hunt. Prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. The women of queens are z prettiest of all. I must be the water they drink. I live for the hunt, my life. Blood for papa. Mr. Borelli, sir, I don't want to kill any more no sir, no more but I must, honor thy father. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong on earth. Return me to yahoos. To the people of Queens, I love you. And I wa want to wish all of you a happy Easter. May God bless you in this life and in the next and for now I say goodbye and good night. Police, let me haunt you with these words, I'll be back. I'll be back. To be interpreted as, bang, 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 uh. Yours in murder Mr. Monster. At the time, police speculated that the letter writer might be familiar with Scottish English. The phrase, me who did you RTS sunny boy, was taken as a Scottish accented version of, my heart, it hurts, sunny boy, and the police also hypothesized that the shooter blamed a dark-haired nurse for his father's death, due to the, too many heart attacks, phrase, and the facts that Loria was a medical technician and Valenti was studying to be a nurse. The killer's unusual attitude towards the police and the media received widespread scrutiny. Psychologists observed that many serial killers gain gratification by eluding pursuers and observers. The feeling of control of media, law enforcement, and even entire populations provides a source of social power for them. After consulting with several psychiatrists, police released a psychological profile of their suspect on May 26, 1977. He was described as neurotic and probably suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, and believed himself to be a victim of demonic possession. Letter to Jimmy Breslin On May 30, 1977, Daily News columnist Jimmy Breslin received a handwritten letter from someone who claimed to be the .44 caliber shooter. The letter was postmarked early that same day in Englewood, New Jersey. On the reverse of the envelope, Neatly hand-printed in four precisely centered lines, were the words, Blood and Family, Darkness and Death, Absolute Depravity.44. 
The letter inside read. Hello from the gutters of NYC which are filled with dog manure, vomit, stale wine, urine and blood. Hello from the sewers of NYC which swallow up these delicacies when they are washed away by the sweeper trucks. Hello from the cracks in the sidewalks of NYC and from the ants that dwell in these cracks and feed in the dried blood of the dead that has settled into the cracks. JB, I'm just dropping you a line to let you know that I appreciate your interest in those recent and horrendous .44 killings. I also want to tell you that I read your column daily and I find it quite informative. Tell me Jim, what will you have for July 29th? You can forget about me if you like because I don't care for publicity. However you must not forget Donna Loria and you cannot let the people forget her either. She was a very, very sweet girl but Sam's a thirsty lad and he won't let me stop killing until he gets his fill of blood. Mr. Breslin, sir, don't think that because you haven't heard from me for a while that I went to sleep. No, rather, I am still here. Like a spirit roaming the night. Thirsty, hungry, seldom stopping to rest, anxious to please Sam. I love my work. Now, the void has been filled. Perhaps we shall meet face to face someday or perhaps I will be blown away by cops with smoking. 38s. Whatever, if I shall be fortunate enough to meet you I will tell you all about Sam if you like and I will introduce you to him. His name is, Sam the Terrible. Not knowing what the future holds I shall say farewell and I will see you at the next job. Or should I say you will see my handiwork at the next job? Remember Ms. Loria. Thank you. In their blood and from the gutter, Sam's creation, point four four here are some names to help you along. Forward them to the inspector for use by NCIC. The Duke of Death, the Wicked King Wicker, the Twenty-Two Disciples of Hell, John, Wheaties, Rapist and Suffocator of Young Girls. P.S. Please inform all the detectives working the slaying to remain. P.S. J.B. Please inform all the detectives working the case that I wish them the best of luck. Keep them digging, drive on, think positive, get off your butts, knock on coffins, etc. Upon my capture I promise to buy all the guys working the case a new pair of shoes if I can get up the money. Son of Sam. Underneath the, Son of Sam, was a logo or sketch that combined several symbols. The writer's question, what will you have for July 29th, was considered an ominous threat. July 29th would be the anniversary of the first .44 caliber shooting. Breslin notified police, who thought that the letter was probably from someone with knowledge of the shootings. The Breslin letter was sophisticated in its wording and presentation, especially when compared to the crudely written first letter, and police suspected that it might have been created in an art studio or similar professional location by someone with expertise in printing, calligraphy, or graphic design. The unusual writing caused the police to speculate that the killer was a comic letterer, and they asked staff members of DC Comics whether they recognized the lettering. The Wicked King Wicker reference caused police to arrange a private screening of The Wicker Man, a 1973 horror movie. The New York Daily News published the letter a week later after agreeing with police to withhold portions of the text, and Breslin urged the killer to surrender himself. The dramatic article made that day's paper the highest selling edition of the Daily News to date, more than 1.1 million copies were sold. Police received thousands of tips based on references in the publicized portions of the letter, all of which proved useless. All the shooting victims to date had long dark hair, and thousands of women in New York acquired short cuts or brightly colored dyes, and beauty supply stores had trouble meeting the demand for wigs. Lupo and Placido shooting June on June 26, 1977, there was another shooting. Sal Lupo, a mechanics helper, 20, and Judy Placido, a recent high school graduate, 17, had left the Eliphas discotheque in Bayside, Queens, and were sitting in Lupo's parked car at about 3 a.m. when three gunshots blasted through the vehicle. Lupo was wounded in the right forearm, while Placido was shot in the right temple, shoulder, and back of the neck, but both victims survived their injuries. Lupo told police that the young couple had been discussing the Son of Sam case only moments before the shooting. Neither Lupo nor Placido had seen their attacker, but two witnesses reported a tall, dark-haired man in a leisure suit fleeing from the area. One claimed to see him leave in a car and even supplied a partial license plate number. Moskowitz and Violante shooting July 
The first anniversary of the initial .44 caliber shootings was approaching, and police established a sizable dragnet that emphasized past hunting grounds in Queens and the Bronx. However, the next and final .44 shooting occurred in Brooklyn. Early on July 31, 1977, Stacy Moskowitz, a secretary, and Robert Violanti, a clothing store salesman, both 20, were in Violanti's car, which was parked under a streetlight near a city park in the neighborhood of Bath Beach, on their first date. They were kissing when a man approached within three feet of the passenger side of Violanti's car and fired four rounds into the car, striking both victims in the head before he escaped into the park. Violanti lost his left eye. Moskowitz, the only blonde victim of Berkowitz, died from her injuries. That night, Detective John Falotico was awakened at home and told to report to the 10th Homicide Division at the 60th Precinct Station House in Coney Island. He was given two weeks to work on the Moskowitz and Violanti case as a normal murder investigation. If it could not be solved in that time frame, it was to be given to the son of Sam Task Force. Suspicion, August 9. Local resident Cassilia Davis was walking her dog at the scene of the Moskowitz and Violanti shooting when she saw patrol officer Michael Cataneo ticketing a car that was parked near a fire hydrant. Moments after the traffic police had left, a young man walked past her from the area of the car, and he seemed to study her with some interest. Davis felt concerned because he was wielding in his hand some kind of dark object. She ran to her home only to hear shots fired behind her in the street. Davis remained silent about this experience for four days until she finally contacted police, who closely checked every car that had been ticketed in the area that night. Berkowitz's 1974 door yellow Ford Galaxy was among the cars that they investigated. On August 9, 1977, NYPD Detective James Eustace telephoned Yonkers police to ask them to schedule an interview with Berkowitz. The Yonkers police dispatcher who first took Eustace's call was Wheat Carr, the daughter of Sam Carr and sister of Berkowitz's alleged cult confederates John and Michael Carr. Eustace asked the Yonkers police for some help tracking down Berkowitz. According to Mike Novotny, a sergeant at the Yonkers police department, the Yonkers police had their own suspicions about Berkowitz in connection with other strange crimes in Yonkers, crimes that they saw referred to in one of the Son of Sam letters. Yonkers investigators even told the New York City detective that Berkowitz might just be the son of Sam. Arrest, August 10. The next day, August 10, 1977, police investigated Berkowitz's car that was parked on the street outside his apartment building at 35 Pine Street in Yonkers. They saw a rifle in the back seat, searched the car, and found a duffel bag filled with ammunition, maps of the crime scenes, and a threatening letter addressed to Inspector Timothy Dowd of the Omega Task Force. Police decided to wait for Berkowitz to leave the apartment, rather than risk a violent encounter in the building's narrow hallway. They also waited to obtain a search warrant for the apartment, worried that their search might be challenged in court. The initial search of the vehicle was based on the rifle that was visible in the back seat, although possession of such a rifle was legal in New York State and required no special permit. The warrant still had not arrived when Berkowitz exited the apartment building at about 10 p.m. and entered his car. Detective John Falotico approached the driver's side of the car. Falotico pointed his gun close to Berkowitz's temple, while Detective Sergeant William Gardella pointed his gun from the passenger's side. A paper bag containing a .44 caliber bulldog revolver of the type that was identified in ballistics tests was found next to Berkowitz in the car. Berkowitz then stated flatly, Well, you got me. As described in Son of Sam, 1981, by Lawrence D. Klausner, Detective Falotico remembered the big, inexplicable smile on the man's face. Now that I've got you, Detective Falotico said to the suspect, Who have I got? You know, the man said in what the detective remembered was a soft, almost sweet voice. No I don't. You tell me. The man turned his head and said, I'm Sam. You're Sam. Sam who? Sam. David Berkowitz. An alternate version claimed that Berkowitz's first words were reported to be, Well, you got me. How come it took you such a long time? Detective John Falotico was officially credited by the NYPD as the arresting officer of the son of Sam. 
Police searched apartment 7E and found it in disarray, with satanic graffiti on the walls. They also found diaries that he had kept since he was 21 years old. Three stenographers' notebooks nearly all full wherein Berkowitz meticulously noted hundreds of Aussens that he claimed to have set throughout New York City. Some sources allege that this number might be over 1,400. Soon after Berkowitz's arrest, the address of the building was changed from 35 Pine Street to 42 Pine Street in an attempt to end its notoriety. After the arrest, Berkowitz was briefly held in a Yonkers police station before being transported directly to the 60th Precinct in Coney Island, where the detectives' task force was located. At about 1 a.m., Mayor Abraham Beam arrived to see the suspect personally. After a brief and wordless encounter, he announced to the media, the people of the city of New York can rest easy because of the fact that the police have captured a man whom they believe to be the son of Sam. Confession, August 11. Berkowitz was interrogated for about 30 minutes in the early morning of August 11, 1977. He quickly confessed to the shootings and expressed an interest in pleading guilty. The investigation was led by John Keenan, who took the confession. During questioning, Berkowitz claimed that his neighbor's dog was one of the reasons that he killed, stating that the dog demanded the blood of pretty young girls. He said that the, Sam, mentioned in the first letter was his former neighbor Sam Carr. Berkowitz claimed that Harvey, Carr's black Labrador retriever, was possessed by an ancient demon and that it issued irresistible commands that Berkowitz must kill people. A few weeks after his arrest and confession, Berkowitz was permitted to communicate with the press. In a letter to the New York Post dated September 19, 1977, Berkowitz alluded to his original story of demonic possession, but closed with a warning that has been interpreted by some investigators as an admission of criminal accomplices, there are other sons out there, God help the world. At a press conference in February 1979, however, Berkowitz declared that his previous claims of demonic possession were a hoax. Berkowitz stated in a series of meetings with his special court-appointed psychiatrist David Abrahamson that he had long contemplated murder to get revenge on a world that he felt had rejected and hurt him. Sentencing Three separate mental health examinations determined that Berkowitz was competent to stand trial. Despite this, defense lawyers advised Berkowitz to enter a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, but Berkowitz refused. He appeared calm in court on May 8, 1978, as he pleaded guilty to all of the shootings. At his sentencing two weeks later, Berkowitz caused an uproar when he attempted to jump out of a window of the seventh-floor courtroom. After he was restrained, he repeatedly chanted, Stacy, his last victim, was a whore, and shouted, I'd kill her again. I'd kill them all again. The court ordered another psychiatric examination before sentencing could proceed. During the evaluation, Berkowitz drew a sketch of a jailed man surrounded by numerous walls. At the bottom he wrote, I am not well. Not well at all. Nonetheless, Berkowitz was again found competent to stand trial. On June 12, 1978, Berkowitz was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison for each murder, to be served consecutively. He was ordered to serve time in Attica Correctional Facility, an upstate New York supermax prison. Despite prosecutors' objections, the terms of Berkowitz's guilty plea made him eligible for parole in 25 years. Detention After his arrest, Berkowitz was initially confined to a psychiatric ward in Kings County Hospital where the staff reported that he seemed remarkably troubled by his new environment. On the day after his sentencing, he was taken first to Sing Sing Prison, and then to the upstate Clinton Correctional Facility for psychiatric and physical examinations. Two more months were spent at the Central New York Psychiatric Center in Marcy before his admission to Attica Prison. Berkowitz served about a decade in Attica until he was relocated c. 1990 to Sullivan Correctional Facility in Fallsburg, where he remained for many years until he was transferred to Shangam Correctional Facility in Ulster County. Berkowitz described life in Attica as a nightmare. In 1979, there was an attempt on Berkowitz's life in which the left side of his neck was slashed from front to back, resulting in a wound that required more than 50 stitches to close. Berkowitz refused to identify his assailant, and he only claimed that he was grateful for the attack. It brought a sense of justice or, in Berkowitz's own words, the punishment I deserve. 
Born Again Christianity. In 1987, Berkowitz became an evangelical Christian in prison. According to his personal testimony, his moment of conversion occurred after reading Psalm chapter 34 verse 6 from a Bible given to him by a fellow inmate. He says he is no longer to be referred to as the son of Sam, but the son of hope. Soon after his imprisonment, Berkowitz invited Malachi Martin, an exorcist, to help him compose an autobiography, but the offer was not accepted. During later years, Berkowitz developed his memoirs with assistance from evangelical Christians. His statements were released as an interview video, Son of Hope, during 1998, with a more extensive work released in book form, entitled Son of Hope, The Prison Journals of David Berkowitz, 2006. Berkowitz does not receive any royalties or profit from any sales of his works. He has continued to write essays on faith and repentance for Christian websites. His own official website is maintained on his behalf by a church group, since he is not allowed access to a computer. Berkowitz stays involved with prison ministry, and regularly counsels troubled inmates. While in the Sullivan facility, he pursued education and graduated with honors from Sullivan Community College. Parole hearings Berkowitz is entitled to a parole hearing every two years as mandated by state law, though he has consistently refused to ask for his release, sometimes skipping the hearings altogether. Before his first parole hearing in 2002, Berkowitz sent a letter to New York Governor George Pataki demanding that it be cancelled. He wrote, In all honesty, I believe that I deserve to be in prison for the rest of my life. I have, with God's help, long ago come to terms with my situation and I have accepted my punishment. Officials at the Sullivan facility rejected his demand. In his 2016 hearing at Shangam, New York, Berkowitz stated that while parole was unrealistic, he felt he had improved himself behind bars, adding, I feel I am no risk, whatsoever. His lawyer, Mark Heller, noted that prison staff considered Berkowitz to be a model prisoner. Commissioners denied a parole. In 2018, the board again denied the release of Berkowitz on parole. His next hearing was scheduled for May 2020. Other activities In 2002, during the D.C. sniper attacks, Berkowitz wrote a letter telling the sniper to stop hurting innocent people. Berkowitz made his comments in a three-page letter to Rita Cosby, senior Chicago correspondent for Fox News Channel, after Cosby wrote him seeking his comment on the sniper attacks. During June 2005, Berkowitz sued one of his previous lawyers for the misappropriation of a large number of letters, photographs, and other personal possessions. Hugo Harmitz, a New Jersey attorney, had represented Berkowitz in an earlier legal effort to prevent the National Enquirer from buying one of his letters. Harmitz then self-published his own collection of letters and memorabilia, Dear David, 2005, which he had obtained from Berkowitz during their consultations. Berkowitz stated that he would drop the lawsuit only if the attorney signed over all the money he made to the victims' families. In October 2006, Berkowitz and Harmitz settled out of court, with Harmitz agreeing to return the disputed items and to donate part of his book profits to the New York State Crime Victims Board. <laughs> Satanic cult claims In 1979, Berkowitz mailed a book about witchcraft to police in North Dakota. He had underlined several passages and written a few marginal notes, including the phrase, Arliss, sick, parry, hunted, stalked and slain. Followed to Caliph, Stanford University. The reference was to Arliss Perry, a 19-year-old North Dakota newlywed who had been murdered at Stanford on October 12, 1974. Her death, and the notorious abuse of her corpse in a Christian chapel on campus, was a widely reported case. Berkowitz mentioned the Perry attack in other letters, suggesting that he knew details of it from the perpetrator himself. Local police investigators interviewed him but they, now, 2004, believe he has nothing of value to offer. The Arliss Perry case has since been solved. After his admission to Sullivan Prison, Berkowitz began to claim that he had joined a satanic cult in the spring of 1975. In 1993, Berkowitz made these claims known when he announced to the press that he had killed only three of the Son of Sam victims, 
Donna Loria, Alexander Esau, and Valentina Suriani. In his revised version of the events, Berkowitz said that other shooters were involved and that he fired the gun only in the first attack, Loria and Valenti, and the sixth, Esau and Suriani. He said that he and several other cult members were involved in every incident by planning the events, providing early surveillance of the victims, and acting as lookouts and drivers at the crime scenes. Berkowitz stated that he could not divulge the names of most of his accomplices without putting his family directly at risk. Among Berkowitz's alleged unnamed associates was a female cult member whom he claims fired the gun at Denaro and Keenan, both of whom survived, Berkowitz said, because the alleged accomplice was unfamiliar with the powerful recoil of a .44 bulldog. Berkowitz declared that, at least five, cult members were at the scene of the Freund deal shooting, but the actual shooter was a prominent cult associate who had been brought in from outside New York with an unspecified motive a cult member whom he identified only by his nickname, Manson II. Another unnamed person was the gunman in the moskowitz violanti case, a male cult member who had arrived from North Dakota for the occasion, also without explanation. Berkowitz did name two of the cult members, John and Michael Carr. The two men were sons of the dog owner Sam Carr, and they lived on nearby Warburton Avenue. Both of these other, sons of Sam, were long dead. John Carr had been killed by a shooting judged a suicide in North Dakota during 1978, and Michael Carr had been in a fatal car accident in 1979. Berkowitz claimed that the actual perpetrator of the Damasi Lamino shooting was John Carr, and he added that a Yonkers police officer, also a cult member, was involved in this crime. He claimed that Michael Carr fired the shots at Lupo and Placido. Case reopened. Journalist John Hockenberry asserts that, even aside from the satanic cult claims, many officials doubted the single-shooter theory, writing, What most don't know about the Son of Sam case is that from the beginning, not everyone bought the idea that Berkowitz acted alone. John Santucci, Queens District Attorney at the time of the killings, and police investigator Mike Novotny both expressed their convictions that Berkowitz had accomplices. NYPD officer Richard Johnson, involved in the original investigations, has opined that unresolved discrepancies in statements from witnesses and surviving victims indicate Berkowitz did not act alone. Why are there three suspect cars, five different suspect descriptions, different heights, different shapes, different sizes of the perpetrator? Somebody else was there. Other contemporaries have voiced their belief in the satanic cult theory including Donna Loria's father, and Carl DeNaro who stated his opinion that, more than one person was involved, but admitted he could not prove the cult theory. DeNaro's conclusion rests on his criticism of Berkowitz's statement to police as, totally false. John Deal's recollection is that he physically bumped into Berkowitz outside the wine gallery restaurant as he and Christine Freund departed and walked to his car where the shooting occurred. Berkowitz, in contrast, told police that he passed within a few feet of Deal and Freund shortly before they entered the car. Deal contends he and Freund passed no one on their way to the car and further that the placement of the car parked at the curb would have made it impossible for Berkowitz to have snuck up on them in the few minutes between their encounter outside the restaurant and the shooting at the car. Deal thus reasons he was shot by someone other than Berkowitz. Hockenberry's own report was broadcast by Network News and given much exposure by Dateline NBC, 2004. In it, he discusses another journalist, Maury Terry, who had begun investigating the Son of Sam shootings before Berkowitz was arrested. Terry published a series of investigative articles in the Gannett newspapers in 1979 which challenged the official explanation of a lone gunman. Vigorously denied by police at the time, Terry's articles were widely read and discussed. They were later assembled in book form as The Ultimate Evil, 1987, expanded second edition 1999. Largely impelled by these reports of accomplices and satanic cult activity, the Son of Sam case was reopened by Yonkers police during 1996, but no new charges were filed. Due to a lack of findings, the investigation was eventually suspended but remains open. From prison Berkowitz continues to assert and expand upon his claims of demonic possession. He stated in a series of nine videos in 2015 that the voice he heard was that of Sawin, a druid devil and the true origin of Son of Sam. He added that it never was a dog, saying that detail was fabricated by the media. Skeptics Berkowitz's later claims are dismissed by many. 
Breslin rejected his story of satanic cult accomplices, stating that, when they talked to David Berkowitz that night, he recalled everything step by step by step. The guy has 1000% recall and that's it. He's the guy and there's nothing else to look at. Skeptics include a former FBI profiler, John E. Douglas, who spent hours interviewing Berkowitz. He states that he was convinced Berkowitz acted alone and was an introverted loner, not capable of being involved in group activity. NYPD psychologist Dr. Harvey Schlossberg states in Against the Law, a documentary about the son of Sam Case, that he believes that the satanic cult claims are nothing but a fantasy concocted by Berkowitz to absolve himself of the crimes. In his book Hunting Humans, 2001, Elliot Layton argued that, recent journalistic attempts to abridge, or even deny, Berkowitz's guilt have lacked all credibility. Legacy Decades after his arrest, the name, Son of Sam, remains widely recognized as that of a notorious serial killer. Many manifestations in popular culture have helped perpetuate this notoriety, while Berkowitz himself continues to express remorse on Christian websites. Nasa Moskowitz, who previously had not hidden her hatred of Berkowitz, wrote him a letter shortly before her own death in 2006, forgiving him for killing her daughter, Stacy. In a sad twist of fate, Moskowitz lost all her children at young ages Jody, age 9 or 10, possibly a suicide, Stacy, and Ricky, about 38, of scleroderma, circa 1999. She had no survivors, except, according to the New York Post, her daughter's murderer. Legal impact after rampant speculation about publishers offering Berkowitz large sums of money for his story, the New York State Legislature swiftly passed a new law that prevented convicted criminals and their relatives from making any financial profit from books, movies, or other enterprises related to the stories of their crimes. The U.S. Supreme Court struck down the so-called Son of Sam Law for violating the First Amendment's right of free expression in the 1991 case of Simon & Schuster, Inc. v. Crime Victims Board, but New York produced a constitutionally revised version of the law in the following year. Similar laws have since been enacted in 41 states and at the federal level. Literature Jimmy Breslin, in collaboration with writer Dick Shop, published a novelized account of the murders, .44, 1978, less than a year after Berkowitz's arrest. The highly fictionalized plot recounts the exploits of a Berkowitz-based character dubbed Bernard Rosenfeld. Outside of North America, the book was renamed Son of Sam. The 2016 young adult novel Burn Baby Burn by Meg Medina is set in New York during 1977, and depicts how fear of being one of the Son of Sam victims affected the daily lives of people. He's also referred to by Lee Child in his Jack Reacher series short novella High Heat 2013. TV and film The Spike Lee drama Summer of Sam was released in 1999 with actor Michael Badalucco in the role of Son of Sam. The film depicts the tensions that develop in a Bronx neighborhood during the shootings, and Berkowitz's part is largely symbolic. A minor character in the script, he functions, mostly as a berserk metaphor for Lee's view of the 70s as a period of amoral excess. Berkowitz was reported to be disturbed by what he called exploitation of, the ugliness of the past. Other movie portrayals of Berkowitz include Uli Lomel's Son of Sam, 2008, Direct to Video, and the CBS television movie Out of the Darkness, 1985. The character of Son of Sam played a significant minor role in the miniseries The Bronx is Burning, 2007. Oliver Cooper portrayed him in the TV series Mindhunter, 2019. Music Son of Sam has been popularly and mistakenly associated with the contemporaneous song, Psycho Killer, 1977, by Talking Heads. Likewise, Elliot Smith has stated that his song, Son of Sam, is not literally about Berkowitz. Compositions more directly inspired by the events include Son of Sam, 1978, by The Dead Boys. Son of Sam, by Chain Gang, and 
Looking Down the Barrel of a Gun, 1989, by the Beastie Boys. Guitarist Scott Pateski used the stage name, Daisy Berkowitz, while playing with Marilyn Manson in the 1990s, and the band's song, Son of Man, conspicuously describes Berkowitz. Several other rock musicians established a full ensemble named Son of Sam during 2000. A cartoon composite of Berkowitz and the breakfast cereal icon Toucan Sam was featured in Green Jelly's comedy rock video Serial Killer, 1992, by the name of Toucan Son of Sam, but it was later removed under threat of a copyright lawsuit by the Kellogg Company. Thanks for listening to Wiki on Tape. I hope you drop by again sometime. Goodbye.